This week's episodes were brought to you by the generous support of Yukofin. Uh, so today we're going to be working on this. We've got a fair amount of features in here as is. I mean, one of the big things was the map generation and the data handling for the actual hex objects. Um, I do have a, I have it set to a fixed seed right now. So every time you load the game, it does have the same map currently, but it does randomly generate this map with continents and things like that. We just have it set to a constant seed to make it easier to test because, uh, especially when we're doing the pathfinding, so I could confirm every time that we were getting the same terrain so that then we could go and, and check and make sure that we were happy with that. Um, we have this, uh, this button to go to the next turn, but it currently doesn't do anything yet. That's going to be one of the things that we do today. And the other thing I would like to do today is uh, the ability to have cities. So, like, maybe... And we could either start with a city, or we could make a settler object that can spam a city. I think I'll do it in that order first, is I'll, uh, hell, I might add it to this dwarf guy, just to say, we'll, we'll throw in another little button over here, so that you can click the button, and he'll just plop down a city. Maybe it won't consume him, but just so that we can confirm that we can make new cities, add it to the list, uh, and then we can click on the city and, you know, queue some things up or something like that. So that's where we're going to go. Um, in terms of a recap, I mean, we basically just did it. I mean, we've, we've been working on this sort of engine and things like that. We'll, uh, everything is fairly compartmentalized. So you don't necessarily need to, like, upload all the code into your brain to follow along with this. So in terms of what to do first, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to finally get this next turn button to start doing something. It may not be literally the most exciting uh, thing to get started on. Or, or we can start with the city. The ability to plop down a city. What would people prefer to get started? If we did the city, we'd have to uh, start by drawing something in Blender as well. So maybe we start with the more visual aspect and then get into a little bit more nitty-gritty code. That might work. I don't know. How long have we been on this? Uh, probably a couple of months now. Uh, but we only do we only do two videos a week typically. So um, we've done a shocking amount of work in remarkably little actual development time. Okay, city is overwhelming, so we're gonna work towards that first. So over in Blender, we'll make a city. Now, um, one of the interesting things that can happen, of course, in these games, is you can go up in ages, and therefore your city can change its look. Um, one of the other things that will happen to the city is it will change what it looks like depending on population size, whether it's got walls, different buildings, things like that. I think for our purposes, we're just gonna design one look for a city now. And we'll start with one of the sort of, um, uh, just like the sort of the smallest city, just like maybe a collection of huts. I mean, you don't want it to look too much, maybe like a, a goody hut, you know, like, um, um, what do they actually call it? Tribal village or something like that. Uh, but maybe a collection of huts is a decent way to start. So I think that's what we're going to do. Uh, just especially because designing a hut should be pretty easy. So we're going to add in, I suppose, a cylinder first. Now, we don't need a whole lot of vertices to make this look relatively uh, cylindrical and round. Probably, I mean, 16 is probably overkill by itself. Um, the size is also way too big at this point with a radius of 1 because our hexes have effectively a radius of 1. Do they have a radius of one or effectively a diameter of one? I think they might be effectively a diameter of one. Well, it doesn't matter. We can always scale it once we get into unity. But in any case, we're going to shrink this down and shrink it down kind of that way. Um, as a start, we are also going to go and take this thing. And we are going to move it in the Z axis by 0.1 so that it's level that way. Um, city. Just make something simple like city skylines. Yeah, we'll just what we'll do is we'll re-implement all of city skylines within our game so that we can have cool cities on a world map. I think that the, you're right. That is absolutely um, the most reasonable, I think, uh, solution. So what I'm going to do here with my cylinder now that I'm in edit mode. By the way, if you've never used um, Blender, I still have not done a full... Well, I've done a little bit of, like, touching on the basics of Blender. I'm far from a Blender master. Blender is a 3D modeling program. It is free and open source, which is wonderful. One of the problems with all 3D modeling uh, software is that because they're innately very complex, um, all of them have really insane user interfaces. Whether you're talking about Blender or Maya or 3D Studio Max or you know many, many others, they all have user interfaces that can be very intimidating to get started. Um, but 
after you've got some experience in it, it all sort of makes sense and it's very quick, especially once you learn all the hotkeys and whatever. So with this cylinder here, I'm just going to go to the front view, going to hit tab to go into edit mode again. I'm going to hit Z to go into wireframe mode. I'm going to use B to box select the top of this. I'm going to hit E to extrude, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit escape. So we still have the extruded vertices, but they're in the same place as before. Then I'm just going to hit S to scale it up. Then I'm going to extrude again and sort of shrink down. We're going to like, I don't know. There we go. It's a little hot. And, uh, hey, do I want to? There we go. Mostly, more or less to a point. Maybe, should we shorten this whole thing? Feels like it's a little too tall, right? A little bit more of a squat kind of hut kind of thing going on there. Sort of a tent. Is a yurt, is a yurt an appropriate word for this? I, I don't know. I think yurt specifically has this has to do with um, how it's built. We're gonna turn smoothing on and then go ahead and put edge split in here, which A, tends to make things look right, and B, tends to make things look proper in Unity, because um, Unity sort of needs explicit um, triangle splits to be there. Uh, so, we've got that. We could do all sorts of texturing and whatnot on here. Um, but I think that's probably overkill to consider for now. So what I'm just going to do is I'm going to go ahead and duplicate and shrink. Excellent. There we go. So we'll get a few extra little tents, huts, whatever, scattered around the main one. And that is going to be our city. Yurts tend to lack the, the lip on the roof. Oh. All right. And presumably, I think in, in something like this, what you would do is you'd actually have a hole in the middle here uh, to let the smoke in. But good enough. Good enough for us right now. Quickly do a model. We're sort of doing a little bit of the let them dare mentality. Like, just get it in here. Get it in here fast. So we'll pop out of here. So if I save it in the right place, there we go. We have our little city visual in here. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of our hexes. I'm going to drop it in the game world and oops, switch out a 2D view over here. So this is our default little hex. And we want to be in isometric view because I much prefer, there we go, the camera that way. So if you click on the little cube here in Unity, you can switch between perspective mode and isometric. Perspective will, will do the proper thing where sort of things in the distance get smaller. Um, but A, I often prefer to see isometric because while it doesn't have a perspective and things don't, shrink in the distance, which can look a little odd. It can it can be a little clear to see how things line up. But more importantly, if you double click on an object, or I think F is also the key to like, yeah, F will lock your view to whatever you have selected, same as double clicking in the scene. And if you're an isometric view and you rotate with your right mouse button, it'll rotate around the object you have selected. Whereas if you're in perspective mode, what's just gonna do is rotate the camera. Both have value. Um, certainly if you're sort of doing like a, a first person kind of thing, you want to get a sense of how things look, this probably makes the most sense. But for almost everything that I work on, I want to be focused on an object and then pan around it. Anyway, what I want to do with this is I just want to take our, I'm going to create an empty inside of this. As always, you could just take your model and drop it into the scene, but you almost always want your model graphics or all your graphics, this even applies in a 2D kind of thing, to be a sub object of an otherwise empty game object. That gives you way more ability to scale or rotate or whatever your objects independently of your base item. It also makes it really easy to swap graphics in and out afterwards. So inside of this hex, just for testing, I'm gonna right click on the hex, say create empty. I'm gonna rename this to something like city. I'll call it city 01, you know, sort of first size city. I don't know, whatever. We'll probably have variants of it, it's fine. Then inside of that game object, I'm gonna drag our model into there. All right, so we've got that, and apparently, I guess, oh, we do have a radius of one on our hex as opposed to our diameter. So I did make the city graphic too small, but that's okay. We'll just scale up the city graphic like that. Notice that our prefab, our game object, still has a scale of one, one, one across the board. Um, so all I'm gonna do is, now it's not part of the hex, I'm just gonna put it in the thing, but this was an easiest way to make sure that we were in the same location. That looks good. So I'm gonna go ahead and drag the game object, the base game object, into our prefabs folder over here. So again, the, the advantage of this is I could do things like decide to rotate the city graphic and things without making any changes to the base object whatsoever. Much, much, much better way to go about things. We got a tip in over here. Who dat? It's Anonymous. 
crinkle, crinkle. Ooh, a piece of chocolate. Someone found some chocolate. I have um, I have a dime bar upstairs, D-A-I-M, that uh, Centra brought back from Scotland. I love those things. We cannot get them here. I might have to dig into that a little bit later. Who does as well? Darren Tenary. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, don't like programming. Just wanted to say uh, I had to stop uh, stop subscribing a while back, but I recently got Amazon slash Twitch Prime, and I've used that to come back and subscribe to the best streamer there is. Uh, my favorite. Oh, well, thank you very much, Darren. Appreciate it. And it's totally fine if you're not into programming. We play different games and things every Saturday because everyone likes something different. So that's why the Saturday stream is always kind of just random stuff. You archive these. Oh, you mean the, the video I'm doing now? This will get uploaded to the Quill 18 Creates programming channel after we are done. Um, and you'll also be able to get the code. Uh, the code is all being hosted on GitHub as well. So you can go ahead and download all that. And yeah, thanks to everyone who uh, who's using their Twitch Prime subscription. It's kind of annoying that it doesn't re automatically resub every month for Twitch Prime. I don't know why it's like that, but you have to remember to manually hit that button. But I appreciate it anyway. Um, okay. So we have a city graphic now. It's not textured, but that's fine. So let's go and... What we want to do now... Let's think about this. Let's give the this dwarf the ability to act kind of like a settler. So the idea is when you select the dwarf, okay? When you select it, and we don't have an icon, we don't have like a, a thing right now that shows that this dwarf is selected. That's fine. We could do that pretty easily. Um, and maybe we're going to want to do that. Maybe we want to do that now. I don't know. Could be. Sure, probably. Let's do that. Um, but right now, the only indication that you do have this guy selected is that there is this little... Um, this little pop-up over here, this little panel that opens up to show that we've got this unit selected. Um, the two of two is his movement. I believe the zero is the length of his movement queue that we've got in here for debugging. Yeah, you can see the length of his, of his movement queue, which goes down as he goes there. So in a strategy game, such as, for example, Civilization, uh, you would have, while this unit is selected, a series of buttons over here. What buttons are present are going to be contextual based on the abilities of the thing we have selected. Um, but let's go ahead and let's add a, I don't know, just like a Boolean true-false on our units that say, can build city, true-false. And we're just going to turn it on for the dwarf for testing purposes. That's going to be fine. Uh, we got another tip in. Who that? Hey, Roka Josh, thank you very much. Speaking of Dime Bar, have you ever had Dime Cake? from Ikea. No, it is perfection in a dessert. I did not know that was a thing. Mm, mm. Dime bar is pretty similar to a score bar, I think, but I, for some reason I like it better. First time I ever had it was actually in Sweden, oddly enough. It was just a tiny little like individual portion. Um, Dime ice cream is the best. That would be really good. Okay, so on our unit, so this unit class, this unit class is just a pure data class. It's not a mono, um, uh, it's not a mono behavior, so it can't be attached to a game object. That's fine. It's a pure data class. It implements the Q path unit uh, interface over here, uh, which is our pathfinding system that we tried to make properly generic for the very first time we've implemented a pathfinding system that should be generic enough to be applied to most any game we use in the future. There's probably still some more cleaning up to do, but it's there. Uh, what I'm going to do is this QPath thing. I will probably go and make its own GitHub project later on so that, you know, people who have more tension span and programming expertise than me can really go and, and slicken that up. Um, for the future. But yeah, what we're going to do here is we're just going to, I'm going to put it up with the stat block over here. For that, we'll continue to just make it a public. We can always turn it, I'll, I'll just make it a public field, which is exactly the same thing as a property with a public getter and setter. And later on, we might decide to, to change those. But um, from the outside, at the very least, the getter is always going to be public because why not? So right now, we'll just go ahead and make a public field that says something like, can build cities? is a settler, like, can build cities is going to be fine. Now, normally these things would all default to false and then we would set them to true um, only for individual things. Um, for testing, I don't know, where do we instantiate the dwarf? Because we don't start with the dwarf in play or anything. So we must spawn it as part of our map creation. 
We have our dwarf prefab. We have this unit, right? It's not dwarf I should be looking at. It, sh it should be the unit class. Spawn unit at, there we go. That's, nope, not declaration. Find references. So there we go. Okay, it's in our content creation. At some point we spawn a unit. We create a unit and we spawn it. So what I'm gonna do over here is I will keep can build cities to be false, but when we create our thing, um, we'll just say uh, for debug or for testing, I don't know, for development, Turn on can build cities um, on this unit. I treat it like a settler. We'll need some sort of like unit template system at some point that has like all the types of units that can be built in the game. Specifically when we start working on our, our city sort of build screen, right? It's going to need to know like, well, we've got infantry, we've got archers, we've got settlers, we've got workers, we need whatever. So there's going to have to be a list of units with all these flags correctly set up. And then we just like basically copy one of those and then instantiate that into the game. Um, but yeah, we'll just set can build cities to true over here. Cheers. Oh, another one from Roka. Here's another 250. As a thanks to these tutorials, your space parallaxing background was a lifesaver in Ludum Nair 39. Oh, cool! That, oh man, that makes me so happy to hear. Thank you very much. That's awesome! Uh, list of abilities rather than unit types, maybe. I think I'm missing a thread of the conversation. Um, where's the Petra object? Yes, we'll have to work on, on, on some sort of Petra. Except the Petra is just going to be a building that you can build in every single city. There you go. It's going to be great. Um, okay, so we've got that on. Now, the next thing we're going to want to do is in our user interface, the compile, 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 start responding in. Thank you. The little toolbar over here that opens up. We need to adjustify that now. Uh, it's been a little while since I've done this. So yes, we've got selection panel over here, which has a unit, unit selection panel script attached to it under the UI folder. Oh, look at me organizing my code and everything like that. Um, so we've got that. Now, by default, this thing is turned off. So let's turn it on for a second so that we can do some work to it. And then presumably what we're going to have is in this unit panel, uh, so there's a content area. I would suggest that we have another empty. This thing is going to be attached to the top left corner, but it's going to be above. And it's going to have, I'm going to give it an extended width here. This is going to be the button area. I mean, basically. So it's going to have your, like, your fortify button, your alert button, your auto explore button, whatever. But in, more importantly, it's going to have the build city button at this time. Uh, so, yeah. Button area. And we will make a button in here, um, which is just going to be... So button is just something with an image. Well, um, you can use the built-in button script over here. Um... I'm going to delete the text because it's just going to be an icon, presumably. A button object is just something with an image so that there's, you know, something you can click on uh, paired with some sort of behavior that answers to that. By default, when Unity, when you add in the button here, it creates the image script. It also has a built-in button script. You don't have to use the button script to make a button work, but it handles things like mouse over to, like, prettyfy things and whatever. So we're going to do with that. I'm going to switch to use the blue circle over here. Same thing that we used there. Um, if we go to set native size, oh, that looks just about right, which is excellent. This button area, I'm going to suggest that it should have a horizontal layout group, which does not expand the children and does provide some amount of space between them. So if we go and dupl duplicate that, we get a series of buttons that start to create. Looks reasonable. Action bar! Action bar. 
action bar. I love it. Okay, that's what we're going to rename this area. That's going to be fine. So we have some boutons now, which is going to be lovely. Um, and this is going to be something like the build city button. Like that. Now, obviously, it's going to need some sort of icon on it. I suppose I could put, just put the... Uh, I'm going to put the text back in for now. Uh, that's obviously not what we're going to want in the, the future. We're just going to want different icons for things. Uh, but this text will just say city. Boom, boom. There we go. It's ugly. It's perfect. <laughs> I could go for an action bar. Maybe an intense chocolate coconut flavor. <laughs> If you spend all day programming and you're starting to feel a little bit sluggish in the mid-afternoon, grab an action bar. That's great. Da, 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 da. Um, I don't do unit tests when I do the Unity dev, partially because the, the scope of the things that we do um, is a little bit different. Um, I, unit testing is something I definitely did use when I was doing like web application development. Um, and especially because it was a lot of like sanity checks on the actual data structures of things. Um, it is an excellent way to develop um, and it certainly works in Unity. Unity has great support for unit testing, uh, but you, yeah, there's there's a time and place and I think in, in nothing else, the scope and the way we do these tutorials, I don't think um, is the right way to do it, but I should just do a tutorial talking about unit tests at some point. Um, so we have that. Now that's always gonna be on right now. So what do we want? I guess in our selection panel script over here, we probably want some sort of um, game object. We want to be linked to our uh, city build button like this because we want to be able to turn that button on and off. Uh, something I'm curious about. If we turn this off, does it reflow? It does reflow. Excellent. Okay, good. So, then what we're going to do in the update, um, if it's not equal to null, I guess the mouse controller is responsible for turning the entire selection panel on and off, which I is fine-ish, I guess. Uh, but in here, we want to say something like um, city build button dot set active. And we want to set this active based on if the selected unit can build cities. There we go. So right now, it should just always be on. Um, so again, if I take the selection panel here and do the default again, which is it's supposed to be off. And we click on the unit, we get this button. It doesn't do anything right now, but it's there. Now, one of the things is if we do click on this, um, our actual mouse controller is responding to all these mouse up and downs. One of the things we may want to do is have the mouse controller check to see if we're above a UI element. Now, this is kind of an interesting and tricky area because it would be great you know, say um, something like check here, question mark, to see if we are over a UI element. If so, ignore mouse clicks and such. Um, I think that's probably okay for detect mode start because what we could also do is have it at the top of the update. But the reason I'm saying we're not going to do it there, because there's an interesting and very annoying issue in Civ 6. If you are in Civ 6, and um, let's say you've got, you've got your unit, and you're trying to draw a path. If you are above uh, some sort of UI element, including things like um, you've got the, uh, for, for resources on the map, you've got the little circles to show that you've got, I don't know, silk in this area or whatever, if your mouse happens to be over that little circle that shows that there's silk here, when you let go of the mouse, it does not register that you have let go of the mouse because it notices that you're above a UI element and it just ignores that. So ideally we would like to, um, I mean, we, we definitely want to ignore things properly. Like we don't want to have, you know, if, if, 
if there's a unit behind here and I click next turn, I actually don't want to select the unit, which is just what happened there. So I think the right way to do it is to not ignore it in update, do ignore it in mode start, and possibly some of the sub modes will also explicitly check um, some of these things. So how we do that in the event system now? Hold on. I know we just got to tip in uh, Unity uh, mouse over UI. Detect mouse over UI um, from the more recent system. It's very easy to check. Event system dot current. There we go. Event system. I need to include the event system in here. Well, I guess I could just type event system dot. Whoa, no. And then say, hey, could you resolve that by adding the using command? Okay. Because we need to be using Unity Engine dot event systems over here. But now I can say the current one dot is pointer over game object. So if event system is pointer over game object, then we just return immediately without starting any new modes, which is presumably okay. Although we might want to like to do, do we want to ignore all GUI objects? Um, consider things like uh, unit health bars, um, resource icons, etc. Um, although, if those are set to non interactive or not block raycasts, uh, maybe this will return false for them anyway. So that's something for us to double check, right? Because you can set a, um, a canvas group on a UI object and you can mark something as non-interactable or that it doesn't block raycasts. And maybe if those things are true, this will not uh, return true if you're on top of one of those things. We could double check on that, but for now we're gonna do this. So if we go, can you make the unit into a eye pointer click handler, which then called? Yes, uh, we can. Um, there's and we've talked about this before. There's a couple of different ways. There's two major ways to handle mouse clicks. Either you can have each individual object, like for example, um, your dwarf over here, have a some sort of on click handler in some way, or you can have a centralized mouse manager. And every single time I've done something where individual objects have their own on click handler. I've ended up having to do a rewrite at some point anyway, because with a game like this, there are multiple different types of modes that your mouse can effectively be in, right? If you've got a unit selected and you're sort of, you know, clicking over here, or um, you could have, uh, like I always click on a unit and then right click on the destination. But another way to do it is to click on a unit, hit the move button, then your cursor changes into some sort of move command, and then you can click somewhere else. Well, it's very important to know that you're in that mode where you're use, you're moving this unit when you click here, so you don't like click here and select a different unit, right? When you meant to attack it or select a city when you meant to move your unit into the city. Um, so no, no matter what, you always need some sort of centralized manager to indicate what mode your mouse is in. And what happens is if each one of your units and, and cities and UI elements have their own sort of script to manage that sort of thing, they all have to check and always do the right thing. Whereas if you just have one centralized mouse controller that then farms out the job to everything else, the, there, you only have to check this in the one mouse controller. For example, this thing where we check to see whether we're over a mouse pointer uh, game object. Although if you were using the UI systems on powder, pointer over, then it would, you know, yeah, then you'd have layering and things that would be correct. So your mileage may vary and it may depend on the scope of the game, but I've every single time I've done something where I had the click or pointer behavior on individual objects in the game, it has not worked out so well. Although for the UI elements, certainly, like I'm not going to have my mouse controller check to see if I'm specifically over the next turn button. No, the next turn button has an eye pointer thing built into it because that's the, uh, the button script right? This, um, this built-in um, uh, button script here has all those uh, interface implementations. So, and that's fine. Anyway. All right. 
so, dun, 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 dun. where are we? Oh, yeah, we need to, uh, I think we need to make the build city button do something now. Boop, 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 boop. So the question now is, who should do the build city behavior? It would be very easy to add a script to this button, um, which might be fine. Or we could add the script to the actual unit. Or we could have the behavior be something on the map. For example, when we click this, we tell the map that it should build a city at the location where selected unit is. I think logically that's the, the way we're going to do it. I think it's at some point, no matter what, it makes sense that we should tell the map, hey, map, spawn a city here. Especially since the hex map contains like all the actual hexes and all the actual game objects for the units and all the game objects for the cities as well will be under there. In fact, the city graphic will be a child of whatever map we're on. So I think that is probably the most, you know, sort of logical way to do things. Um, so that would mean in our hex map over here, we presumably will want some sort of function that's something like um, public void spawn city at, uh, which is going to take some sort of city object, which we haven't implemented yet. Um, it's going to want the prefab and the coordinates. It's going to be exactly the same as spawn unit at. Uh, there are going to have to be, we're going to have to keep in mind like sort of faction and player numbers and something like that uh, later on. I think what's going to happen is unit and city will have a player ID as part of it. Um, and when we spawn it here, when we add it to our list, so we have our list of all units, we're actually going to want units to have to be like an array of array, basically, uh, where they're indexed based on, on players or something of that nature. The button plays the opening bars to, to Starship. Oh, what? We built the city? <laughs> Something like that. Now, I think we got a tip in while I was talking here. Uh, Anonymous, thank you very much. Uh, did you see that Unity issued a critical security update yesterday? Indeed, I did. And I did actually go and update my Unity for that. Um, I didn't look into it. It looks like it's probably the sort of thing where you could put malicious code into, like, um, a download from the App Store or something like that. Like, it, I don't think it was something that was terribly relevant. But, yeah, I did go ahead and update that. So yeah, I think this is going to be the code, so which means we're going to need a city object. So what I'm going to do um, is we're going to create a new C-sharp empty class called city. And, um, oh yeah, it's going to create all the namespace stuff, which we're not using, although we may want to. Um, I should have probably just copied the unit class because it's the thing that's going to be the most similar here. Here, we're going to grab this stuff because this is all going to be very handy. We don't actually need QPath, so we're going to trim that down. Um, I guess we don't actually have a constructor for a unit, do we? Fair enough. So the city will probably have a name and at hit points or something like that. This is just going to be, you know, some placeholder things for now. Uh, the city name is going to be Brussels. Excellent. Uh, so now we have a class, which means that this script here will no longer error out, which is good. So I think we're still going to need, uh, we're still going to need a UI script for the build city button and um, we may as well put that script on the build city button itself and I could go ahead and have it implement um, I click handler but I think what I'm gonna do is just have a public void um, build city like that and all it's going to be responsible for is game object dot find object of type hex map. We're making certain assumptions here, but it's going to be okay. Uh, use the UI you made for the notification. Yeah, because notifications are a key part. Like when it's nice to know when a city can bombard something at some point. Uh, build city. 
Spawn City. Spawn City at. So we're going to create a new city. City, city equals new city. Um, so that's going to be that. It then needs a prefab. Um, right. Which I guess what I'm going to do. Again, we have very simple um, implementation of this right now. We'll do something later on when we get our sort of database. Uh, so just like we have the one semi hard coded in uh, unit dwarf prefab, we're going to call this one the city prefab. And then again, it'll be public. So uh, we are going to hex map map equals this because we're going to have to refer to a couple bits of it and we don't have to search for it multiple times in one use. So the prefab is just going to be um, city prefab. Yeah, that, that clearly has to change later on. Um, and then it, it needs a position which is going to be based on the uh, mouse controller MC is equal to game object find object of type mouse controller because then we can say mouse controller dot selected unit dot um, hex dot q hex dot r so there we go so at the position where our selected unit is we're going to do this now the only way this button should ever be active and be able to call build city is if we have a selected unit so this should never be called otherwise and if we call it otherwise it's going to throw up an error i mean i could put in my own error check in here to say w2ef there's no selected unit but that's already going to happen it's already going to throw up an error and be nice and loud so i'm okay with that michaelity thank you very much for the tip Hey, Quill, longtime Lurker fan here. I'm having my own Polish jam this weekend, unless it's Polish, but I'm assuming Polish, this weekend for a game I plan on releasing soon. Uh, you've been the greatest influence that got me this far. Can't thank you enough. Well, congratulations, Mike. I hope your game goes well. Again, we want more games need to exist in the world. So it makes me so happy when people uh, take some of this stuff and make their own game and probably be way, way, way more competent than I am. So yeah, so again, if any of these things go wrong, we're already going to get an error, so I'm not going to worry about explicitly checking for errors because it's fine. It'll fail loudly, which is what we're looking for right now. Um, oh, so the only thing we need to do, is that set to public? It is. So what we need to do now is on our build city, when our button gets clicked, we have to respond to it. We are going to... Uh, use our very own object, the build city button script, and we're going to call build city over here. And this build city button script simply calls the hex map and tells it, hey, spawn a city here. Now it doesn't do anything yet, so I guess that would be the next step. Um, but we can check to make sure that all this stuff is wired correctly for now, because why not? Um, let's go and put in debug.log spawn city at. So if we go here and we go here, we'll see if there's any errors. So we select our dwarf, we click this and we get spawn city at. Excellent. And no errors so far. So go to declaration. We are going to want a array of city cities or rather a hash set that's going to be fine uh, this is going to be city to game object map and so just like with spawn unit at we're going to make sure that these things are in existence now you have to be careful when you're copying and pasting stuff like this because god knows it's really easy to forget to change something somewhere and then you get a really wonky and hard to find bug sometimes okay there we go we have our array over here um so it's just like the spawn unit at we are going to um we're gonna get a hex so get hex at q and r that's fine we'll get the game object for it that's gonna be okay as well 
then we're going to tell our city that it belongs to this hex, which we haven't implemented yet. You know, is it starting to feel like anyone else, like unit and city, should both be derived from the same base class? Like we should have a map object base class? So it's starting to feel that way to me. And even our unit view over here, what's different between the unit view behavior and sort of just any map object view behavior? This one, um, the difference between a city and a unit is a city never moves. So on object moved will never be called, but otherwise it'll be the same. They might have idle animations, they might have that. I mean, it's really <laughs> one of the first things that happens when people learn object oriented programming is they want to go crazy with inheritance. And one of the things with component oriented programming, uh, which is what Unity really encourages, and in fact, what almost all game design encourages as much as possible, component oriented programming is so powerful and so useful for most things, but especially game programming, it turns into be way more important. But I think this is kind of an obvious example of some shared behavior. Um, Roka, oh, thank you very much again. I just wanted to say thank you specifically for your tutorial on reading image files and transforming them to levels. Oh yeah, the quick way of doing that, yes. Using this game that I'm currently working on, it's an amazing method. Yeah, I really like that. Um, there are gonna be some more tools introduced soon into Unity to make like level design a little bit more practical, but I still love the idea of reading an image as sort of your level design. And it's really easy to like enable modders that way too. It'll also make it easier to implement attacking cities down the road once you get combat. Absolutely right, because cities um, also have hit points. Now, not all map objects might have hit points, and you could subclass. You could have map object and then a subclass version of it that's like attackable map object. But I think for there, the best way to do is to have a flag. Map object can be attacked, yes, no. Map object faction, yes, no. Or maybe like a, it's a number, and maybe a minus one is for like neutral, just stuff that's there on the map to look cool. Um, in a sense, forests are map objects, but I think we're going to keep implementing things like forests as a terrain feature instead. So, all right. So what we're going to do is we're going to implement a new script. So new empty class map object. I think it's a perfectly fine name for it. Um, and likewise, we're gonna get rid of this and this and that, and then bring this all down. Probably should be namespacing things, but that's okay. Um, and our unit over here, we're just gonna grab these. We don't necessarily need all these things in this file, but it's gonna be fine. And we're gonna specify that you derive from map object and you still implement IQ thing, and the city will also derive from map object. So I think that things like names will go here. Um, I guess we'll do that and that. Oops. You know, we still need to quote quotation marks. I guess hate editors that like do things for you. Um, I'm still gonna have the hit points start at 100 for things. So in our unit code over here, um, we're gonna set uh, name equals dwarf. And then we don't need to set these. I mean, there's probably other things that we'll do, but that's going to be okay. Um, and then, yeah, some sort of like public bool can be attacked um, is equal to true int um, public int faction ID is going to be something. We'll, we'll sort that out. 
Um, so things like hex can go there as well. Um, I think the unit move delegates, we're going to take these and move them down there. Now we're going to save everything and then we're going to rename this to object moved delegate. There you go. If you use um, F2, it'll do a, um, a proper global find and replace of this name on object moved. There we go. And not just to find and replace. It does it smartly because like if you had, you know, on object moved two or something like that, it wouldn't do the replacement there. So move that to the base and something like set hex will move down here as well because these are all shared. Um, there might be some other things too. So let's check to see if we've got any weird errors. How come, how come this didn't get fixed? Oh, because I didn't resave the file. Right. So we get a few of those where like um, it's trying to do something, but you have to make sure to save the file to do it. Uh, you are complaining that hex.remove unit has some invalid arguments. Ah. So our hex is trying to keep track of units, and instead we're going to change it to well. That's interesting. Because hex should definitely still differentiate between units and cities, probably, for map objects. Now, what I could do is rename this to add map object. We shall also apply here. Um, no, but it's not, it's not smart enough to use the right one. <laughs> I could have this just accept the generic map object and then check the type, but that's not great. I could make this a virtual function that you still have to implement in the other thing, which replaces, repeats a lot of code. I'm going to keep this as add unit and I'm going to make set hex actually part, part of unit again. And we will require that map object implements some sort of, uh, so this is going to be a um, abstract public void. So if you make something that's a map object, you're going to have to implement set hex. And this will be a public override, actually. I'll write it that way. It's going to be fine. It's abstract. Oh, 
um, this has to be an abstract class. You can't instantiate map object by itself. Although maybe we do. Maybe we just want to make it virtual. You know what? That might be okay. Make it a virtual, it'll do everything except add itself to a hex this way. Because then here, we can just call our base class set hex new hex, and then remember to tell the hex that this is a unit that should be added in. That might be fine. We'll have to check. Like, I'm just worried that I'm going to do something. I'm going to write myself in a corner that leads to wonky stuff. Um, I don't actually use old hex, do I? Oh, yes, I do. Probably broken about 30 different things. Okay. I'm sure there'll still be things that we find that aren't quite right, but it's going to be a decent start. So that should probably be a method on hex rather than units at this point. Um, yeah, we talked about things like that. There's a couple of different things that it does, though. Now, and it won't be on... on set hex won't be over here because it needs to do slightly different things, whether it's a unit or whatever. Um, and I don't want hex to go like, is this of type blank or is this of type blank? Like if it's of type unit, then do this. Cause that's what we could do, right? We could implement this as map object instead of unit, right? But then in here, we'd still have to check, you know, what kind of stuff it is or do some funky things. I suppose you could do a list of hash sets where the, or a dictionary of hash sets where the key of the dictionary is based on the true class of whatever you, yeah. I think this is gonna be fine. You can set the map object class as the type for the hash set. Yeah, exactly, yeah. You could do something like that. Um, I think it's going to be okay. We could retune it later on. I think the end result is going to be the same. The only question is which which um, which approach is going to lead to fewest errors and or less annoying programming. So um, we'll do this for now so we can move on. So where are we at? Spawn city at, right. So at this point, we've got a city. We've got the prefab for the city. We've got a position. Um, and we can now tell the city to set its hex there. The city itself is not telling the hex that it's in a particular position, but that's okay. Unit view. I think is perfectly fine. I think it's perfectly fine to convert this to a um, map object view. The only difference between the two, again, because cities might have animations, all kinds of things might have animations. Um, the city will never will never move, so on city move should never be called. Um, I guess we don't even strictly need a script for this. Like when we spawn, uh, where's my, my hex map? When we spawn a unit, so we've got that. The next thing we do is we instantiate the prefab, which is all the same. Um, we don't necessarily need to register an on unit object moved. Um, 
I guess that's fine. And then cities dot add city city. So I guess it doesn't even need the unit view code right now because they're going to be static. But later on, we might want to add some some logic in there. But for now, we don't really need it. Um, add city city game object, which we don't have because I didn't name this properly. So if I hit play and I click this and I click this, oh, we never actually set the city prefab. <laughs> city prefab right here goes in there in the inspector. So again, hit play, click the dwarf, click the city button. We have a city. It happened right there. Oops, I did not mean to hit that. I mean to clear the filter. Um, click the dwarf, click the button, click this. Uh, turn off 2D mode. Ha! And then if I take my dwarf and I tell him to move over here, and then I click city. Ah! So obviously, if this is a true settler unit, after you build the city, you would then simply delete the unit. It's a two second thing, um, but we're fine. Okay, do cities stack? Right now they do, right now they do. Because what we don't do is we don't check in the hex whether they've got a city or not, which is the next thing we're gonna do here. Um, because we need to make a, we need to override the base set X behavior on map object to check to see if the hex already has one and like really complain. Like we gotta check when you hit the build city button, um, in fact, we should probably have the build city button be disabled if there's already a city there or something of that nature. So um, we have this units list over here in our hex. I think what we should probably have is something like city, right? Um, and then where we have, uh, we have an add unit over here. We could probably have something like void add city, which is going to have um, if city not equals null, that's where we freak out royally. Like, uh, we could throw exceptions, but for now, logging error is going to be fine. Uh, and we can say trying to add a city to a hex that already has one. And we just return right away. Otherwise, we set city, um, this.city is equal to city like that. Um, this dot city. I should have maybe just called it C over here to make it less likely that I'm going to uh, F things up. Um, and then we'll have a remove city. And we're going to say something like if this dot city is equal to null, trying to remove a city where there isn't one. I can't imagine what would cause us to possibly do that, but we'll try that. And then we'll also have one if this dot city is not equal to city. Um, I mean, we could just call remove city with no parameters whatsoever and just clear it out, but I think it's fine. Um, uh, trying to remove a city that doesn't, that isn't ours. There we go. Because otherwise, we're just going to say this city is then equal to null, like that. So we have an add city, we have a remove city. And so just like in the unit, we override the base set hex for a city. We'll also override the base set hex over here. Um, we... This would be to like remove our city from our previous hex and put it in a new one. Like, will a uh, city ever leave a hex and enter a new one? Mobile cities? Doesn't seem very likely, uh, but technically, like, could be a thing. I don't know. Uh, this might, we might want to do some sort of, like, weird check here. Like, we're already part of a hex. It doesn't make sense for a city to ever move. 
but yeah, I mean, Beyond Earth, you're right, has the mobile cities in the in the ocean. So I mean, it could happen, sure. Um, and then we call the base version a set hex, and then we tell the set the hex that it's supposed to add a city over here, like that. Um, and again, we don't do any checking to see like if this is successful or anything. Um, and maybe we could do that first. What, is, what does set hex do? Oh yeah, it just actually updates this and then checks on object moved in case anything's listening to that, which right now our city does not listen to that. There's nothing that listens to if a city moves. So again, we'd need, you know, like either change unit view to map object view or create a city view or something like that. Um, but that's, that's for something that we can implement later if we ever get mobile cities. Uh, so if we run this again, and we click on our unit and we hit city. We get a city. If I click again, I should get an error. Trying to add a city to a hex that already has one. But it probably has indeed created two copies of this city at this point. Um, so what do we do to prevent the duplicate city? Because right now, it this will prevent like the hex from overriding the previous city or whatever. But it still spawns the dummy game object and adds it in there. So we need some way to confirm... Either this works, so we could have the whole thing wrapped, uh, instead of just doing a debug.log error, we could have the whole thing throw an exception um, and then catch that, which is probably the most sensible way of doing it. We also probably want to do something where the button doesn't show up uh, if it's an invalid state. I mean, that's step one, number one. Don't show the user something that doesn't make sense because they'll just hit the button and then nothing will happen. That would be ridiculous. Um, but we might also want something inside the game to make sure that it's consistent and, um, you know, that nothing goes really, 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 really wonky. Um, and we could certainly do that, right? Like this, you know, log error, we could just have it throw an exception. And then probably in hex map over here... Um, Right here, this is the thing that could throw the exception, and we could just have it check for that. Because up until this happens, I mean, we've instantiated an object, but we haven't added it to any list um, or anything like that, so we could just bail. Um, we could just bail on it really easily. We haven't created the game object. Uh, yeah, we've just captured, yeah. So, I mean, that's probably a good and smart way to do things. So, in something like here, we should probably throw new exception. Um, just any generic unity exception is fine. And we can provide a string in here, right? Yeah. So, instead of doing a log error, we'll just like, whoa, you're trying to do something really goddamn bad really really bad here this is a double plus ungood we'll throw that and, and exceptions are actually a great way to do things um if you don't catch the exception the game will just sort of crash at that point which is often fine especially in debug state but here what we're going to do is we're going to do a try we're going to try to set the city's hex um and then we will catch uh, exception E over here. Just catch unity exception is fine because we know it's going to be at least that. Um, although we could do something a little smarter around that and then say something like debug.log error E dot, um, is it just called message? I think it is our object to be converted and then we'll just return so let's see if that actually worked out well i don't um in the tutorials we haven't covered a lot of the exceptions and i don't tend to use them that often when i do my unity uh when i do my um blood and dares either so the syntax i may have effed up so we're gonna add a city that was fine i'm gonna try to add another one there we go so we just get the error message and it did not in fact add a second city over here because it bails out early and that's probably one of the best ways to do it. Instead of like returning true or false and then you have to make sure to check for that above. Here, if you fail to check for the exception, then the whole program just... Uh, we could actually do that, right? If I... Let's say I do that here and then I just comment out this entire block. So I'm not catching the exception. So what's going to happen in this particular situation? Do, 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 do. This should also work out fine. So we'll build a city. Then we'll build a second city on top of it. And again, we didn't catch the exception. And the game at this point, 
I guess it doesn't crash because the Unix exception actually gets caught by the editor and then throws it to the debug log, but we don't have to crash the program just because we tried to spawn a city in the same place as there already was one, although maybe we would want to. Here we'll just return the error and then pretend like this never happened. But from a user point of view, what we should do in our unit selection panel, um, we're trying to decide if the unit build button should be active or not. So what we're going to do is something like this. We're going to say, if the selected unit can build a city and the selected units dot hex dot get city is not equal, um, is equal to null. Do we want get city? Because a hex has a, a list of units and it also has this flag for the city. We currently have no accessor for it. We could, we could turn these into properties. So we can make this a public property with a getter and maybe a protected setter. So anyone can read hex.city, um, but they can't change the hexes. Um, they can't change what city the hex is pointing to. And we could do the same thing with the units here, capitalize it, make this a public uh, this is a little wonkier though. I think what I would do here is do a public array of units. That is only a getter, no setter. And all it does is return units dot to array or something like that, which might be like inefficient or something, but it does give you the ability to get the list of arrays uh, or the list of units. And in a way where you can't modify the original hash set, you have to go through the helper functions to modify the hash set. That might be the best way of handling it. Hmm. Instead of an open borders agreement, want to pay a fee to go through territory. That's interesting. So you have to pay gold for every tile you go through or something like that. I mean, you could already in Civ, you can trade an open borders agreement for money or something. So that sort of kind of already exists, but um, what am I doing? Oh yes, I remember what I'm doing. So in the unit selection panel, I wanna be able to say if hex dot city equals null. So we only enable the button if this is a unit that can build cities and the tile that it's in doesn't already have a city in it. So now if we go back over here, we have a thing. Hex already has a definition for units. Oh! Okay. Well, hey, ho! Uh, I'll get rid of the function. So we had a function that was similar to the accessor. I think the accessor is maybe, I don't know, six of one half dozen to the other, right? So there you go. So over here, we were calling hex under units. We were calling units that way. We'll just call it as a, as a property instead. Six of one half dozen of the other. Okay. So who is that? That was Kalen Cheney. Thank you very much, Kalen. Hey, I love all your videos. I watch so much of your programming at this point that I'm starting to pick up uh, some of your habits in my code. Not all my habits are good. I'm going to be the first person to admit that. You know, I work quick-ish at least and relatively clean, but it hardly means that I have so many bad habits. Uh, um, anyway, keep up the good work. Well, thank you very much, Kalen. Thanks for your support and the kind words, certainly. You forgot to remove the set hex above. Oh, thank you very much. Boop. There we go. Cheers. Um, all right, so that's that. So we want to check to see that. Compile, 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 compile. When we select you and we build a city. Oh, <sighs> D 
Do this. True. Else. Also true. There we go. Now we have no button. If I move here, we've got the button again. If I move back over here, we have no button. Okay. So we make sure the game has got an internal thing to make sure that you can't double up on a city. But more importantly, we show the player that you can't double up on the city. And that's great. So I think the next thing to do would be the ability to maybe click on a city and then have it do things. All right. So like that would be a thing. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to go into our hex map continent. And this is the thing that spawns a dwarf. What I'm going to do is I'm going to also spawn initial city for debug purposes. Uh, just one to the right. And we will use the city prefab for that. Or one to the left, actually. So now if we do that and we start, we'll get an error because sure, why not? Um... Where's my, oh, there it is. Uh, oh, derp. <laughs> uh, city, city equals new city. Excellent. Spawn a city over here. Groovy. All right, now my coffee's empty. Mm -hmm. I love that idea. Um, App and Loon, a more generic action button system that can check a configurable number of requirements. Um, I love things that, you know, have like generics and delegates and things like that that you can program in. Um, and I think that if we were to implement our user interface as something that you can like build in like basically like Lua and configurable, configurable template files and be really moddable. I think that's exactly the way you'd want to do it. Um, and I think that that makes a lot of sense for things. I think for our purposes here, it's probably okay to have these tiny little scripts for each one, which is effectively the same thing. I mean, um, either we pass in the, the function that checks to see if something can be enabled or not um, as a, like an anonymous function, a lambda, an action, or something like that, or we do this. I think for now it's going to be okay, but I kind of agree that's probably the way things are going to go in the future, uh, especially as we figure out how we want to define our unit templates and the various action templates and things. 100% agree. That's very likely. Um, oh, you like Total Warhammer Let's Plays? I'm actually thinking about playing it a little bit more. I'm sort of craving a little bit more Total War Warhammer, and if I'm going to play it, I may as well record it, right? I mean, clearly, we'll do the Warhammer 2 when it comes out, but I might do a little bit more of the Warhammer 1. I might just continue the Dwarf Let's Play. Um, oh my god, I swallowed that wrong. <clears throat> I'm going to die. Okay. <clears throat> One of the things, and this is actually something that I really don't have very much experience with. I would love to have a little nameplate above the city, right? I think we can all agree that that would be the way to go. Um, and I would love to use the UI system for that. What is the best way to implement that? Do we have individual canvases for each one that's set in world space? Because you can do that. Right? I could create a new UI canvas that operates in world space and gets um, centered relative to its parent and then has um, an image that is, I don't know, that, that big attached to it and has a wee bit of height. Um, that is too tall, you know, something like that. And it has some sort of cool looking sprite, uh, like the blue panel thing. Reference pixels per whatever. Is this one of these I want to change for the scaling or something? Or maybe it is just scaling. Maybe I want to change the height 100 by 25 and then scale this down by 0 0.01, 0 0.01, 0 0.01. No, how do I get the thing to do the thing that I want? There's got to be a way. Rather than having a canvas for each individual object can be quite taxing. And that's what I suspect. 
So I expect what you instead have is a single world space canvas. And then within that world space canvas, you have your, um, your individual graphic objects that automatically track whatever it is. The problem is like they're sort it, it's very convenient to have this be a child of the city because it's it's linked in the same position, right? As the city moves, the child moves automatically just as as part of the unity hierarchy. But I think that what we have to do is have one world space canvas with these individual images and the images need a script on them to uh, to update their position relative to the correct city every single frame. Someone else just said for performance better to have many canvases. So now we're getting conflicting things. Someone says canvas reach individual element can be taxing and someone else says it's for performance better to have. I don't know if it matters. I don't I bet you there's something we can find online. Unity. One canvas uh, versus many or something like that. There's probably, I mean, we could do our own, um, our own sort of uh, uh, benchmarking and compare. I'm betting it's not much slower. It might be tiny bit, but I bet you it's not very. Hmm. And what I like about this Something in the canvas changes, everything in the canvas redraws. I mean, I think for the world space canvases, they're going to redraw pretty often anyway, so I don't think it's that relevant. I guess, yeah, maybe the canvas itself in world space can be really aware of if it's off screen or something, so that might actually save it. And it means we don't, because otherwise we would need a script. Either we'd need one master script that loops on every update and changes the, the position of the images, or we need a uh, script on each image that keeps track of its parent. Now, obviously, some of this gets updated automatically, but I or gets updated by Unity, but it's using its internal system. I'm going to say this. Until we find out that this is, like, really bad for performance, we're going to leave it as is. It wouldn't be difficult to make a change one way versus the other. The big advantage of this is we can have this kind of configuration just be part of the prefab, right? Canvas, image. Um, so let me pop out of this. Let me drop my city prefab into the world and find it wherever it is. And under this, go ahead and add the canvas. Um, it is world space. UI image inside of this. Um, blue panel, how come I can't see it? Oh, because the canvas position got all wonky. Um, so if I just set like the canvas size to something, is that... I don't know if the canvas size matters. No, I don't think it does. But I still would like, there's got to be a way to make this look the way that I want. Right? Because this, um, if we were to go into our regular canvas and add in an image, I'm checking the, I'll check the chat in a second. There's probably someone who knows the solution. Right? It's a nice sliced image, which means what it does is it scales up quite nicely. This, this is the same image I'm using. But in here, it thinks that our image is super small. If I were to go and stretch this,
Yeah, there it is. I want that, but smaller. And does it not really not care about the scale? That makes no difference. Oh, oh, do we want this small? Oh, I went bigger before. I think I want this smaller. Okay, I think I was doing that the wrong way around. So one by 0.25. Bring it to zero and then just above. Uh, and then get me in here. Take me out of two. Ah, there we go. Okay. So this is the right button, but I was doing it too small. I don't think the dynamic pixels makes a difference. Amount of pixels per unit to use for dynamically created bitmaps in UI. Yeah, that's... Uh, well, it would affect text, which clearly we're going to want inside of this. So text, you're going to be embiggened into the same size as that. You're going to be centered up. And you're going to be city name and now you're too big so you're being clipped so if we go and bring this way up or bring it way down okay so it made this real big I can see some blurriness in there. Okay, there we go. I think we're still need need you like bigger, maybe like that. No, that's still okay. There we go. I'm going to come up with some pretty crazy numbers there. We do have a floating nameplate. Um, now, this is rendered in world space. So you get this. Now, that's not really what we want, is it? We probably want that to be facing the camera. Or do we? I mean, it does look kind of neat, but it probably should face the camera. And I think for that, we do need a script. Like, you can't tell... As far as I know, you can't tell the canvas to, like be world space, but also face the camera. Screen space camera is not the solution that we want. Although you could do something like that. I think we want world space, but then I think we want a script on this that should rotate it. All right, well, let's apply this. And so on our canvas presumably we're going to add a component that's called something like face camera um yeah so like the particles yes have the uh, the billboarding um unity billboard like that's the thing but i think that billboard renderer billboarding planes i think we end up just I don't think there's an automated thing in there other than in the particle system. And I think that's part of the shader. Like, you could rewrite your shader, I think, to uh, to take that into account. There's a billboard renderer component, but that's not what we're looking for. Uh, because we're not just rendering a single image or anything like that. So, yeah, I think with this, we just have a... Boop. Um, I guess we'll do a public camera, um, the camera. And if it doesn't get set, if the camera is equal to null, then we just set camera is equal to camera.main. 
like that. So you can either assign a camera to follow or it'll just figure out the, the appropriate one. Um, and transform dot rotation. Do we set it to like the inverse of the camera's rotation or the same? Well, let's try the same and then if it doesn't work, we'll uh, we'll invert it. So the camera dot transform dot rotation. So every frame, you're just gonna do that. So if we go and do this, and then I hit play. Right, well, first of all, <laughs> this is not my camera. Um, oh, we got a scaling thing going on there. That's kind of funny because we don't, we actually can look straight down, although you can, uh, and if we do that, you can tell here it is facing the camera, although weirdly, in the actual camera, is it just me or? This is not actually rendering the way we expect. Um, is it facing its... Is there an implicit UI camera that it's doing something weird for? Because it looked like it was getting thinner and thinner over here. Feels like there's something I'm missing. Is it a local world issue? I don't think so. I mean, it definitely looks fine here. Again, as I zoom out. Well, okay, there's a couple of things. It doesn't actually face the camera. It just copies the rotation. So we probably need to change that because, yeah, it's not actually pointing at. But the thing is here, it definitely looks like it's pointing straight up. But here, does it not look like it's a little sliver? Like it's not actually facing the right way? Apply the prefab. Thank you. Right. Because here, I'm looking at the city I'm working on, but this is the actual prefab. herp derp -ber derp Thank you. So yeah, this one, the camera wasn't, it wasn't rotating because it didn't have the script attached to it. There we go. Okay. Now, it's still not technically facing the camera. It's just facing the same orientation, um, which your mileage may vary. Uh, here's another issue, though. I don't think the world space is correct. Because the problem is, here you can read it just fine, but as we zoom out, this name tag gets smaller and smaller because it's in world space. And that's clearly wrong. That's clearly wrong, right? We want the nameplates to stay exactly the same size, no matter how far we're zoomed in or out. So, I think that means we don't use the world space renderer. I think we use the regular UI system. And have the tokens in world space just be aligned with wherever things are in the world space. I could, and I was thinking about that, scale it based on the distance of the camera, but I think there'll still be weird sort of jitters at different distances and won't look quite right. Can you turn on UI scale in world space camera? I don't believe so. So that's the clone city.
Because, yeah, that's not the sort of thing we're looking to do. And the other problem with the world space uh, rendering is that um, things could actually get in front of it. Right? If we take our dwarf and move it here, then at certain angles, it's actually standing in front of the name tag. Which is kind of neat, actually, I've got to say. But probably not what we want. Yeah, there's no, there's no, it doesn't logically make any sense to have UI scaling when you're in world space mode. So, yeah, I think we were going to throw this away. And instead, um, I'll probably do it as a separate canvas just to keep things organized. This is canvas uh, UI or like sort of the screen overlay. And then we'll create a second canvas, which is going to be just a normal screen space canvas. It's going to work exactly the same as our, our typical canvas. I'm going to put them back to back. But this one's going to be for things like, um, you know, uh, uh, game object UI or map object. UI. This is going to be responsible for health bars, for city nameplates, that sort of jazz. <laughs> this didn't work as planned, so we're going to throw it away. My story of being a programmer. Yeah, because they're, they're completely different intentions. Screen space UI is cool, but not what we want, because what we want is we want a static uh, game element. So in here, we're going to sort of redesign uh, again with image, with this panel. We're going to want these things to be sort of a consistent size, probably a little wider than this, honestly. And maybe even a little taller, something like that. Um, so this is like city nameplate. And it's going to have the text object inside. That's going to be like this and centered up. City name. And probably some other stats around it in some in some fashion. That's going to be all right. Um, and so this thing has to be positioned to align with some sort of some sort of city. Um, so we want probably some sort of script in here. Um, I don't know UI oh, uh, map object, um, like nameplate or something like that. This is going to be responsible for simply being attached to some sort of uh, game object and hovering above it by some distance. Um, so public game object, my target, and I'm going to make a public uh, vector, I don't know, three is fine. Um, that is going to be something like um, uh, position offset, like that. Uh, I don't know if you can set it to something here. Now this is going to be in pixels, so like offset it by like 30 pixels vertically. I can't remember if it's going to be okay with this because of the new. Apparently so. Um, and then during the update, uh, find out the screen position of our object and set ourselves to that plus offset. Uh, unity screen position of game object. Do, 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 do. World to screen point. Ah, very handy. Okay. Um, public camera. The camera. The Khmer camera. I've had way too much caffeine today. I'm getting super jittery. 
Woohoo! Uh, if the camera is equal to no, then the camera is equal to camera dot uh, main. So we can say the camera dot world to screen point. So of my target, uh, which returns a vector three, I'm sure, because this was previous to the vector two. Um, screen pause is equal to that. Uh, and can we just set that directly to my rec transform? So the idea here is to just set rec transform dot, um, I think anchored position to be equal to screen position. Um, I'm just going to do a little if this is equal to null, just return. Really, it should never be equal to null, but right now for testing, because when I launch this, uh, oh, my target dot transform dot position. Unreachable code detected. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Thought that was something new. Okay. So what I want to do is in the city nameplate over here, no, uh, I want to set the game object to oh, in our scene, there we go, city one clone, bam. Is there any chance, because those coordinates sound kind of right. There we go. If I set you down here, I think it has to do with the anchor type we set over here. Because you can see if the city's in the bottom left corner, the position of this is very close to zero. As I like tweak around with it. Cities in the bottom left corner, the position of our nameplate is set to zero, but it's showing up over here, and that's because of its anchor type coordinates. Um, if this were set to, say, top, bottom right. Now, if we pan around, there we go. It's attached there, but still, um, how do I want this to actually... I guess if I just set this to the bottom left, um, and set the anchor to one of these numbers, I must be able to change to get the behavior that I want. I mean, I can just set it the bottom left, and then over here, in my map object, I can just offset it based on half of our width and things. But there's got to be there's got to be a way that I'm happier with. So again, if I tell you that you are attached to uh, the clone. Oh, I'm setting material. That's not what I want to do. Set you in the scene. City one clone. You're now attached to that. I mean, I guess I could just... 
offset the children of this. That might be the best way to do it. That is the best way to do it. So I'm going to do the thing that I say you should always, always do, which is I'm going to put all these graphic elements inside of an otherwise empty object. So you're going to go in there. You are going to be centered to the bottom left of the canvas. Um, I don't really care about your size. And the city plate is going to be centered. Uh, no, you're also going to be anchored to the bottom left of this empty game object, except then you're going to be offset by negative 60 this way and negative 15 that way. And we're going to remove the map object nameplate script from the visuals and instead put it here. Uh, city uh, name plate. Um, what is it called? I put it down here. Put it on there. And then tell you to follow city clone. There we go. So we don't factor in the offset, which could have also been put in there. But I want this to be centered and I want the offset to just, yeah, that's going to be fine. Okay, so now you're centered. Um, we might want to change you to late update or whatever so there's not that weird lag. In fact, that's exactly what we want to do. We want to change you to late update so you happen after all the updates. Because if you run, if this update ran before the code that does the dragging of the screen, then it's always going to be one frame too late. You can change the order of like the, the object in the hierarchy so that it happens later. Although the, the update, I don't know. I don't know what the, sp the specific order of when various updates get done, but we want this to be called after all the dragging happens so that it doesn't have that weird one frame delay. And we want to this screen position plus that. So it's 30 pixels above, although maybe we'll just do that. I don't know. We'll see. So again, we tell you, you're supposed to follow city clone. And now you should be 30 pixels above. And you are. And there's not that weird lag anymore. And it doesn't matter what our zoom is. The city name is exactly ish right. Oh, now here's an idea to avoid some of this, is we kind of want a dual um, offset. Because we always want it to be 30 pixels above us when we're looking straight down. But when we're looking like this, we actually want it to be not using the center point of the city, but like one world unit higher. So we want sort of two offsets, I think. Um, we want, hang on, this is going to be renamed to screen position offset. And a second one that is world position offset. You're going to be up by one here. So we're going to take this plus world position offset. I think that will end up with what we're really comfortable with. So again, we're going to link you to this. So like this, we're okay. Same thing as last time. We're offset 30 pixels this way. And here... We're one world space above the actual city center and then 30 pixels above that as well. But that looks vaguely correct. We might want to do a couple other tweaks or something like that, but that's pretty darn good. And it's a UI element, which means, you know, we could interact with this in a million different ways, right? Um, so, for example, if I went uh, over here and added kind of a button component, right, as an example. So now... This is a button that we can click on and things will occur. So we need, okay, the canvas is just there. We need to make a prefab, create, uh, we'll make a UI folder for this. We're gonna make a prefab out of the city nameplate functionality. Uh, so what does that mean? How do we spawn these?
That's an interesting kind of question. There's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, now, again, the whole prefab thing over here is sort of a placeholder for the future. There's no reason I couldn't make a city nameplate prefab placeholder here. We'd also need a reference to the correct, um, the correct, you know, canvas. But instead, I think what I want to do is I want to add a script here called something like city nameplate. I guess nameplate. You don't have to capitalize the P, do we? City nameplate manager. Am I calling things manager? I guess I have mouse controller. So city nameplate controller. How about that? And it can have a couple of functions in there just to help out and control things. It's always better to like spread things out among different classes whenever possible to keep each class very focused. So we have something like um, um, create city nameplate. So we have, um, all we need for this is, I guess we should ask for the reference to the city, but then ask for a reference to the city game object because we'll be linking those. And then you will need a public um, game object city nameplate prefab. So what we're going to do is we're going to instantiate a new copy of the city nameplate prefab uh, with in ourselves this dot transform. So this is going to be game object. Um, name game object is this um, and it has name game object will have a component on it uh, which is the map object nameplate and it has to have a target which is the city game object and then other things properly but we can have that set up And what we can have is over here, this could have itself clean up. Like if my target is equal to null, then um, the object we're supposed to track has been removed. So let's destroy ourselves. Destroy game object and then return. There we go. So whenever we destroy the a city or unit or whatever nameplate, then we just go and blow it up at that point. Um, the other thing I want to check, uh, right, we don't have any nameplates right now, so there's nothing that's going to happen. I was going to say, make sure that it works properly if we go off screen, although it should. It should work fine off screen and be 100% okay. Um, yeah, we do have some events. And we're going to be putting more of that stuff in there. Although this this self cleanup is going to be okay, the nameplate, the create city nameplate, is probably going to be tied into a messaging system with the hex map. The hex map is responsible for spawning cities, right? Right over here, uh, spawn city, and almost certainly we're going to want an event that is on city created, which will then trigger over here. So we'll have some sort of listener for that. That's going to be a okay. In fact, that's really easy to do. We've got a few events in the game already. Um, for our map objects, for when an object has been moved, and we'll do exactly the same thing. Might be a good time to do it right now for the city nameplate. Probably. So we've got that, and we don't have to worry about removing cities or listening to on city um, destroy events yet. We might want to. Uh, we might want to have that capability later on. For now, we don't need it. So we'll do this as required. But yeah, why don't we in the hex map, rather than have hex map call the city nameplate controller, we'll go ahead and create our event. So we'll take the, the same sort of um, format that we have here, you know, define some sort of delegate with some sort of naming convention. Um, boom, boom. So this is something like um, city created delegate, uh, which is gonna take in the city and city game object, that seems fine, on city created, like that, and when we actually spawn a city, 
spawn city at. Uh, so if it gets to here, it has been completely 100% created. So if on city created is not equal to null, so we've got at least some listeners added in there, we're going to call this with city and city game object. And then our city nameplate thing can simply register itself by saying uh, game object dot find object of type hex map dot on city created. Uh, please call create city nameplate. Cheers. Uh, sorry, not like that. Plus equals. There we go, like this. Um, and it's not relevant, but we could like deregister ourselves, right? On destroy. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't come up, but in theory, we could deregister ourselves. Or on enable, on disable. I mean, there's a bunch of different things we can do. It's I, this will never be relevant in any way whatsoever, I, as far as I can tell. Well, I mean, if we're reloading the scene or this or that or whatever, maybe I don't know. Fuck it, it's fine. Uh, so I'll explain what we did in a second after I confirm that this vaguely works. So, uh, do we still have a dummy city over here? Oh, right, because we were setting up. The prefab, although I think the prefab is all synced. I don't think there's anything for it to do here. Um, the city nameplate thing needs the prefab. Boop. Holy crap, it works. That's amazing. Okay. Um, and yeah, I'm very confident that this city that we had over here, we no longer need its instance to exist play. There we go. Okay, so what is all that shit that we just did? Well, so we've I've done a tutorial on the event system before. This um this city created delegate. This we are just defining a a signature for a function. We're saying city created delegate simply says we're going to expect a function that takes two parameters, that takes a city and takes a game object and returns a void. This, this represents a function signature. And an example of something that follows that function signature, that is not what I want to do. I just want to get this next one other. Thank you very much. Is this, right? Create city nameplate is something that takes a city and a game object and returns a void. So it confirms that it's the correct signature for something. And then we're creating this event keyword. This event keyword, this is very, very, very similar to doing something like this, um, public list of city delegates, city created delegates uh, on city created two. okay? And then we could instantiate the list and whatever, and then what could happen um, over in our city nameplate where we're doing the plus equal, we're basically doing something like this, on city created dot add, on city created two dot add, and we are simply adding this function to this list, and then at some point we're looping through all of the functions in the list and calling each one of those functions, um, and then this gets called. So that means many things in our program can say, hey, I really want to know when a new city gets created. So I'm going to add my function to this list. So whenever a city gets created, this function of mine is going to get called, so I'll be told when a city gets created. The event keyword is, and, and this plus equal, I believe, actually will work here. We could do something, I think plus equal works with lists. Yes, it does. So it's the same thing. We're just adding ourselves to this list. The difference between the event and the list is, first of all, you don't actually have to explicitly instantiate this array that is the event, right? Event is sort of an array, but you don't have to explicitly instantiate it, which is nice. The other thing that's great is that with this public event, while you can add or remove a function to this, this event, which is a list of, of functions, you can add or remove to it anywhere. It's not truly public because what I can't do in this is call this. 
I mean, I don't actually have, you know, the, the, the objects for it anyway, but this would not be allowed. I can't call this event from outside of the class, I believe, unless I've done it wrong. New city, new game object. Yep, there we go. The event on city created can only pair on the left-hand side of a plus equals or minus equals when used outside of the type hex map. So even though it's public, it's not truly public. It's public-ish. So I can add and I can remove, but I can't, I also can't set it. I couldn't do something um, like this. I couldn't like empty this event list. I'm not allowed to do that outside of hex map. And I'm not actually allowed to call this function or this event outside of hex map. But you can register and deregister. And then inside of hex map, whenever a city actually gets created, um, so I can get rid of this on city created too, because that was just as an example. Whenever we spawn a city, after we're done, we just say, hey, if anyone wants to know when their city got created, we're going to let them know. We're going to call this, and it's going to do something. And it's working, because right now, when we create a city, which happens when we hit play, a city gets created automatically, which calls that thing, which creates a nameplate. And if I take my dwarf and say, move him here, and then hit this, a city gets created, so it gets a nameplate. Wow. That's some pretty good progression. Now, we've been going for two hours. I'm going to take, oh uh, yeah, see this error here? This is happening when we're leaving the program because um, on destroy gets called when we quit the program. And because things get destroyed in different orders, the uh, hex map object doesn't exist anymore. So we get that weird error on, on leaving, um, which is why I'm saying like, you don't strictly need to deregister this on destroy. It's probably never gonna come up. I could do a little check to make sure that hex map still exists, but let's just get rid of this so we don't have any confusing errors along the way. It's fine. I suppose, um, does on disable get called before on destroy when you quit the program? In which case we could do that, but let's just hold off. So we've been going to two hours. I'm going to take a short break. When we get back, we are going to continue working on this. Um, I would like to do it so that we can click on a city and have some sort of interface. Do you even have to check to see if it's null? Um, you do have to check to see if it's null. It's one of the things that I didn't think you did, but if no one registers, to here. I'll, I'll double check. Right? So if we go and we no longer register ourselves. So um, on city created, nothing is being added to the on city created event. I believe that in that case, it will give us an error. I'm not 100% sure though. Yeah, it does. Object reference not set to an instance of an object. It's a little odd to me. It's a little odd to me, but you do actually have to check to see if it's null. So it's not quite as magical as one might like, but it's pretty magical. Did I have these? Oh yeah, yeah, that's the right place. All right, short break, be right back. I wanna say thank you to everyone who keeps this channel going and all the August Patreon supporters, including these Mic Check supporters, Yuko Finn, Eric Sumner, Tiburon, Mighty Mix, Pavel Zdanov, Drazion, Michael McClintock, Aaron Toibson, Rarskal, Tinsi, Jesper Bisgard, Julien Gelafon, Marius Field Vold, Speedy Savant, Steven Steger, Thomas Oberson, Jason Yanity, Stephen Bonnerman, Kale the Quick, Neil Blakey Milner, and everyone who's watched, shared, favorited, and subscribed to this channel. Thank you so, so much.